हेलो फ्रेंड्स आई एम डॉक्टर राजेश चौकानिया जनरल पीडियाट्रिशियन फ्रॉम बैंड्रा मुंबई वेलकम टू दिस वीडियो इन आवर सीरीज ऑफ लेस्ट वी फॉरगेट सो फ्रेंड्स एब्डोमिन इज ट्रूली द साइट ऑफ मेनी ट्रबल्स एब्डोमिनल सिम्टम्स लाइक वॉमिटिंग डायरिया कॉन्स्टिपेशन कैन समटाइम्स बी वेरी स्पेसिफिक एंड एट अदर टाइम्स द एब्डोमिनल सिम्टम्स आर वेरी नॉन स्पेसिफिक लाइक क्रॉनिक एब्डोमिनल पेन और इनडाइजेशन एंड देर मे नॉट बी एनी साइंस टू गो बाय In such situations, it may be very difficult to differentiate between organic and functional, and further, if organic, to narrow down to a specific disease. So, at all such times, history contributes a great deal to decide the way forward. Let us revise a few concepts. Acute onset vomiting is primarily GI in origin, but we must always be on the lookout for surgical causes, especially if there is associated abdominal pain, abdominal distension. and or bilious vomiting but what we must remember is that often the cause of vomiting may lie outside the gi system and at such times associated symptoms will alert us to this possibility so you could have fever headache and vomiting suggesting intracranial infection or you could have a chronic weakness followed by chronic insidious vomiting as seen in chronic renal disease or chronic addison's disease and so on and so forth lastly we must remember that vomiting that comes up later in the course of an illness suggests a complication when it comes to diarrhea large volume watery diarrhea suggests small intestinal pathology and small volume frequent diarrhea with mucus and blood suggests a large intestinal pathology we must also remember that diarrhea need not always be infective so it could be due to celiac disease or inflammatory bowel disease or even functional disorders constipation is largely a functional disorder often a lifestyle disease when it comes to indigestion the first step is to find out what exactly is the patient's complaint because patients may use this term to mean anything it could be an occasional loose stool or occasional vomit or a non specific abdominal discomfort or a flatulence or so on and so forth for us medically indigestion means inadequate digestion therefore as doctors we will have to go through the whole process of digestion and look at various factors right from inadequate chewing of food to a disturbed acid environment of the stomach or a disturbed microbiome due to misuse of drugs or to a disturbed enzyme activity due to a actual intestinal epithelial biliary or pancreatic pathology or ultra processed food or a wrong timing wrong quantity of food too much food too less food the same food causing the problem of indigestion again and again and so on and so forth stress lack of sleep etc etc therefore when a patient complains of indigestion it could eventually turn out to be either an organic disease or just a disorder which is due to correctable lifestyle factors recurrent or chronic abdominal pain is also often a diagnostic dilemma the list of causes is potentially long but in most of the cases the underlying cause is benign the commonest cause in children is functional abdominal pain or habitual constipation and the commonest cause in adults is irritable bowel syndrome and functional dyspepsia in children the diagnosis is largely clinical and we almost never need any investigations so to filter out those few whom we need investigations in we must take a detailed history and perform a thorough physical examination obviously any abnormal physical sign will have to be evaluated further but we must look out for subtle pointers like loss of weight in an adult or a disturbed growth chart in a child or a pain that wakes up a child from sleep in the middle of the night now here we have to be careful sometimes children do look absolutely normal their growth charts are normal but they do give us this history of getting up in the middle of the night with pain what may be actually happening is they are getting up for some other reason and then complain of pain and this tends to mislead us in functional abdominal pain the history dates back to months or years in children the pain is variable in intensity and in frequency 
the pain is often short lasting and it does not disturb the child's play or activity usually on examination there are no abnormal findings in such cases we must also look at the impact of the pain on the child's daily life and if there is absolutely no impact then we are very confident and we can easily wait and watch but even if there seems to be an impact on the child's daily routine it does not necessarily mean that this pain is organic it could well be that the child is trying to get some secondary gain so we will have to dissect the situation carefully to pick up habitual constipation we need to extract the history of inadequate defecation with an imbalanced diet with poor dietary fiber with irregular bowel habits on examination we may find non specific gaseous distension of abdomen or fecal masses in the left iliac fossa in a child who is otherwise absolutely normal recurrent epigastric pain could mean an acid peptic disease or functional dyspepsia and it is difficult to separate between organic and functional h pylori is often over diagnosed or wrongly diagnosed and we must make it a habit in such cases to ask the history of inappropriate content or timing of food inadequate sleep inadequate exercise and so on and so forth and give advice on such correctable factors the hallmark of irritable bowel syndrome is change in bowel habits and chronic abdominal pain the pain is described as cramping and is variable in intensity with periodic exacerbations it at times gets relieved with defecation and at times gets aggravated with defecation the change in bowel habits have can be in all permutations and combinations so it could be diarrhea or constipation or alternating diarrhea or constipation or normal bowel habits alternating with diarrhea or constipation since both functional dyspepsia and irritable bowel syndrome are diagnosis of exclusion after ruling out organic diseases the extent of evaluation will vary from case to case and we must follow standard guidelines treatment of ibs begins with lifestyle and dietary modifications followed by pharmacotherapy depending on the severity of cases even acute abdominal pain can sometimes be baffling to localize the anatomy we need to look at the site first localized abdominal pain in any quadrant is always pathological and usually relates to the anatomical placement of organs in that area so for example epigastric pain could arise from the stomach liver or pancreas but when the pain is visceral in character which means it is dull aching and poorly localized it could also be arising from organs which share the same embryological dermatome with that quadrant of the abdomen classic example being an acute appendicitis pain which starts in the periumbilical area because appendix is a midgut structure and then localizes to the right iliac fossa except for this cause of periumbilical pain most other periumbilical pains are chronic and benign other features about acute abdominal pain also guide us so for example a colicky abdominal pain would suggest that it is arising from an hollow organ commonly the intestines but sometimes the ureter or the biliary ducts pathologically a mild dull aching pain suggests the stretching of a capsule of a solid organ or the distension of a hollow organ but more intense pain suggests inflammation as in acute appendicitis and liver abscess where it is exquisitely tender similarly the pain could be vascular in origin as in tender hepatomegaly in dengue a pain which starts very suddenly could be mechanical in origin examples being a ureteric colic where associated hematuria is a clue or a gallstone in an adult or a <clears throat> intersusception in a child or a obstructed hernia at any age acute abdominal pain is often very severe and we must rule out serious causes by looking at red flag symptoms like bilious vomiting abdominal distension bloody stools etc and red flag signs like guarding and rigidity 
but we must also look at subtle signs like disproportionate tachycardia which suggests seriousness. Also, we must remember that the cause of acute abdominal pain is sometimes outside the abdomen, examples being a medical emergency like diabetic ketoacidosis where a clue could be deep rapid respiration with or without a fruity odor or a referred pain due to a right lower lobe pneumonia or a gynecological emergency like a ruptured ectopic pregnancy in a young lady. When we are faced with patients with abdominal distension, our usual approach is that if the distension is waxing and waning, it suggests platus or feces and if it is gradually progressive, it suggests organomegaly, tumor or fluid that is ascites. When a patient with hepatospinomegaly is, has associated pallor or jaundice, the diagnosis is relatively easier. But sometimes we get patients with hepatospinomegaly without any other symptom. So this is an unusual situation where there are signs but no symptoms. In such situations, the first step is to dig or look out for subtle symptoms which may not have been reported by the patients. So such symptoms could be a little loss in loss of weight or a redu reduced appetite or reduced energy levels or reduced activity levels or a change in the bowel habits or sleep habits or behavior of the patient. Presence of any such subtle symptoms in a patient with hepatosplenomegaly could point to a chronic liver disease or presence of such symptoms in a patient with just ascites could point to a tuberculous peritonitis. And similarly, such subtle symptoms in a patient with abdominal distension may be clues to a slowly growing malignancy like a Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hepatomegaly without any other symptoms can also be seen in a fatty liver and hepatosplenomegaly without any other symptoms is usually a disease in evolution. Benign cysts and a slowly progressive thrombosis of the hepatic veins giving rise to a butchery like situation are other causes of progressive abdominal distension without any other symptoms. So to summarize friends, abdominal symptoms could arise from a variety of causes from both inside and outside the abdomen and that is why it has been rightly called the Pandora's box. You never know what you will encounter. But a systematic approach helps us to be rational even in unusual situations when there are symptoms but no signs or signs but no symptoms. Thank you. The next video will be by Dr. Kharesar. Beware of yellow and white. Thank you.